This video is presented in two parts, each about 25 minutes long. Part 1. Basic Technique and Principles Skid trail rehabilitation is a relatively new treatment. For excavated and bladed trails, rehabilitation became a requirement on many sites under the 1995 Forest Practices Code. It will be required on all sites by June 15, 1998. The primary objective in skid trail rehab is to restore the natural hill slope drainage, thereby preventing erosion or drainage diversion. Forest soils are composed of a number of layers or horizons. A typical soil contains an A horizon, which is the dark, nutrient-rich topsoil. The B horizon is the reddish or orange-colored layer below the A horizon and is somewhat enriched in minerals and organic matter. Below the developed soil profile is the lighter colored C horizon, which is the nutrient-poor, dense parent material, which is often an unfavorable growing medium. Lying on top of the mineral soil horizons is a layer of built-up, partially decomposed organic matter called duff, or forest floor. The duff and the A and B horizons are the favorable growing medium that is vital for successful rehabilitation. When skid trails are built, mineral soil layers are exposed, often down to the sea horizon, which represents an unfavorable microsite for seedling germination and growth. Skid trails also disrupt the flow of subsurface water down the slope and may increase the risk of erosion and mass wasting, which may impact other downslope values, such as fisheries and water quality. Excavators are better suited than crawler tractors to construction of skid trails designated for rehab because they have better control over where excavated material is placed, making it easier to put it back in the reverse order. They can also construct trails up a steeper gradient, and overall, excavators tend to produce narrower trails. To rehabilitate a trail, first remove any woody debris from the running surface because this may act as a wooden culvert and divert subsurface water. The running surface is then decompacted in an outsloping manner and soil materials replaced in reverse order. After the topsoil has been replaced, slash and other woody debris is placed back on top. This is done to provide cover to protect the soil from raindrops and erosion and shade for seedling regeneration. Don't overdo it on the slash too much will obstruct seedling regeneration and growth and create an eyesore. It's the fine material that's most important for restoring the forest floor through decomposition. A reclaimed trail presents many benefits in that it has many favorable microsites. Uh, it's an irregular surface. There's organic matter put on top so you'll get shading and better moisture retention and this is very very important on such a hot dry south facing slope as, as such much better than the situation we see off the trail with a, a bit of a duff layer which will cause desiccation of any seeds that do fall on it. In fact not only has Crestbrook observed good regeneration on rehab trails but also good seedling growth. Remember, however, that the primary objective of skid trail rehabilitation is to restore subsurface drainage. When subsurface drainage hits a cut skid trail, it will usually surface and run down the trail until it's directed off by a water bar, dip, or outsloping section of trail. These are all important drainage control features to build into a trail and maintain until rehabilitation. Major runoff events can occur at any time, even during the harvesting operation. Even when water barred, skid roads concentrate the snowmelt downslope, away from hill slope seedlings, which need it during summer drought. With successful rehabilitation, the running surface is decompacted in an outsloping manner. The soil profile is restored such that subsurface drainage can continue down the slope, providing an even distribution of the moisture available over the whole site. To ensure subsurface drainage is restored, deep water bars are still strongly recommended 
because the loose rehabilitated soil may still pipe some water. Deep water bars are left open and run from the inner track out through the side cast. Spacing should be the same as normal deactivation and logs may be placed in the water bars if visuals are of concern. Running surface decompaction should not be done with ripper teeth because continuous rips will divert water. Decompaction is best done by fluffing with the excavator bucket or other attachment being used for rehabilitation. Use two strokes, shallower on the inner track so as not to intercept more water and deeper on the mid-road, about 30 centimeters or one foot. Forget the outer track, it will be decompacted during recontouring. When restoring the contour, it's important not to disturb the natural duff above the trail or cut more into the cut bank or gouge deeper than the side cast on the lower side. Crestbrook feels its success in rehab can be measured by how hard it is to tell where the trails used to be. This road had been built with a D8 cut and we reclaimed it back with a 2700 length belt hole and then was grass seeded and this was approximately about five years uh, since the work has been done and you can see that uh, with the leader growth on some of the trees that it uh, this site can produce trees and we feel that uh, through good reclamation that we can put the site back into almost the same productivity if not the same productivity as the site that's undisturbed around it. Brad, your, the technique you normally use for that? It just cleans up all the, the branches and you put them down and when you go to reclaim it, your bucket will hit all the smaller sticks and it won't dig down with that. Great. Well, that protects the forest floor underneath uh, underneath what you're reclaiming. Yeah. That's good. So we saw him uh, move. Uh, he had to push a couple of trees over and move uh, the coarse uh, logs around. And then he picked up the branches, put them down under here. And then he picked up the forest floor and some of the topsoil put it on top and that would become the running surface uh, below the running surface and then he got the subsoil and made the running surface with that. So you can see this whole running surface the subsoil and we've got a fairly small cut because you were saying that way you need less fill. It's true. Yeah, so that makes good sense as well. Then there's less of a cut needed. You can see here we've got a fairly small cut partly because the trail's running up and down the slope a bit but also because of this construction technique. So that, that sounds very good. So when you come back uh, after you decompact the running surface and take the subsoil back, you're able to feel those sticks and, and just kind of sweep up from there. That sounds very good. Okay, so this is just a spot uh, to show uh, Daryl's construction technique here. We've got the subsoil on top here, and this is a shallow cut, remember, so we didn't need a lot of subsoil. Subsoil on top, then we can see there's some topsoil down here, and here's down over here is our branches. So you can see there's some branches down here, and right here it's a fairly shallow fill required. And so that looks like a real good technique, Daryl. Yeah. And when he put, he says when he pushes those over to make the trail, he shakes all the soil onto the trail itself, so that he can use it in the trail. And the trail That's correct, Mike. He tries to shake as much of it as he can, and then he does push them over. He'll probably bring more of it out when he pulls the trees out to the trail for skinning. Okay, so he'll pull them out, be even more. buck them off, and, right. the, and then the, the stump will be around to be used. Uh, during rehab. That's right. Good. So in terms of layout, I see we're on a section of trail here that's a bit adverse. This is advantageous uh, 
in terms of uh, drainage control. That will but, intercept yeah. water to some degree, yes. But my understanding is the main thing you people do for drainage control is you try to make sure your trails are water bar through all the time unless you're logging right away. That's correct, yeah. If we're going to be away from this area or not into the area before we start logging again, we will cross pitch the trail. And then as soon as they're finished logging, they try to cross pitch it again. Well, I think the big thing is that we've got to strip the, the uh, surface soils and uh, duff layers off first and uh, set them on the low side of the trail so that uh, that's put out of the way and then the coarse rocky materials are stripped off next and placed over the top so that uh, it can be rehabilitated in a reverse order so that everything goes back uh, pretty much as natural as we can get it. Okay. And in terms of how much uh, topsoil do you feel you can handle? It's normally just one lift of topsoil, that's the most practical? Pretty much, yeah. I just, just kind of start from the inside and just rake the material across like at about a 45 degree angle and take the duff layer and the, and the mineral soils off first and whatever depth it is, that's, you know, see how, how deep it is just in color and set that aside first before you put into the rock. So on, on a typical mountain soil you go down to the bottom of the, the reddish peak, right? Right. Okay. And then the, the, the less developed material would stay at the bottom. Right. Okay. Great. And so uh, that sets up the trail for rehabilitation because you got the subsoil on top and the topsoil stored safely underneath. subsurface soils on first, right. then, uh, then what do you do with the uh, original soil? Well, the original mineral soil and the duff layer is then scattered over the top and uh, back pretty much into the original state. I, I noticed you did a, a good job getting uh, getting it off the original uh, forest floor there. Did you find about a 45 degree angle works quite well pretty again? Much, yeah, pretty much a 45 degree angle. So, it's working a bit. so you have a, a standard bucket with the thumb? Right. That's standard bucket with a thumb and no wrist or twist and you're still able to do a good job of that. Right. It's 
shows a number of features that we would like to see with uh, skin road rehabilitation. Okay. Uh, one of these features is that it's, it's recontoured. It doesn't have to, there's the top of the cut up there, it doesn't have to be uh, perfectly recontoured. But uh, it's been recontoured. And presumably the inner, the inner track has been ripped into an outsloping fashion. And then the, uh, the side cast has been piled back up. And on top of that, they have put some organic debris. This was an old cut block, so there wasn't a lot of, of woody debris available uh, for them to pile on this one. You don't want to pile too much because then visually it starts to stick out. But you put a bit of slash on, which helps provide some shading uh, for any vegetation coming back. It, and uh, the finer slash helps pr pr protect the soil from uh, rainfall action and it actually will break down and add some organic matter to the soil as well. However, the most important feature here is the water bar. You can see there's a water bar here that comes through the inner track and it cuts through the mid road and comes out. And that is, uh, that's what ensures proper drainage control for us. And from a monitoring in perspective, that's what we're going to be looking for on Skid Road Rehab. Um, adequate water barring so that we can be sure that slope hydrology has been restored. I take my, uh, I take my top duff off and I lay it on the, on the slope and then I just keep working my top layer off Putting it on the slope. Once I hit all the duff and that's gone, then I keep working my my uh, trail down, my cut down, and laying it all out, so that when I come back to reclaim, I start to the inside and work it up and work around. And it brings all my duff back up on top again. Great. And what do you do with the woody debris that's on the running surface? If it's too thick, I take it off, put it up on the high side, build and uh, cover my trail up, and then I take it off and lay it back on again. Yeah, when, I, when I take my cut, I got my cut here, what I do is I start at the top so that I, when I bring my soil up, I've got my duff and everything, I bring my bucket in, i got my duff and everything, I bring it back up, set it up on top here, and I lay it out on what I already got. And the further I get around, the more of that duff I'm bringing up and putting on top of my trail. Like you're bringing it up all the time. You're curling it around all the time, you're bringing it up, setting it on the trail. First lift. Second lift. Third lift. Looks like he's getting down the top. I drive up to the top and then I decompact and uh, make my water bars coming back. Because I just find 
pulling the material towards you is, uh, is faster and more efficient. You, know, you can't make a water bar going uphill anyways properly. And so that way it's all one operation. That's right. Yeah. yeah. What, what about when you're doing a, a contour skid rope where you've got to cut and fill? You'd still want to there too, decompact like this whole one alongside this yeah. ravine. I do the same. I do it the same way. So you decompact out sloping, and then you uh, pull, the pull the soil the, back up. Yeah, pull the burn back up. So you, you find it best to, just to do that while you're backing up. Right. And then it's just one. You got operation. a little bit more spinning around because you always got to be watching where you're going. But I don't know. I, I think one hands off the other, and you still make make good time. Quite like the water bars you've been making too. They're doing a good job. Spacing should be the same as normal deactivation, and logs may be placed in the water bars if visuals are of concern. Running surface decompaction should not be done with ripper teeth because continuous rips will divert water. Decompaction is best done by fluffing with the excavator bucket or other attachment being used for rehabilitation. About 30 centimeters or one foot. was rehabilitated in the, the fall, Don? Yes, in the fall of 95. And here we are in summer 96 looking at it. So maybe we'll just walk across and, and take a look, try to get the same view. This particular area was done with a, a PC-200 Komatsu with a, a 42 inch rake. Basically when the trail was finished uh, skidding on, we came back and tried to decompact a lot of the the areas and pull back the mineral soil that was uh, displaced from skidding method. A lot of this area was just a matter of, uh, of following laid out, pre laid out skid trails with uh, very little excavation. Some of it was excavated to, to a minor portion and uh, other areas it weren't. And those particular areas on those skid routes we brought back in the rake and decompacted and pulled the soil and the woody material back onto the trail. Here we are up the Lucia River, uh, looking at an example of Skid Road Rehab that was done some time ago. These are zoological pine seedlings that we sampled as one of our retrospective studies. You see uh, trees in the uh, inner track position, the, the mid-road position, and what we call the berm side cast position, where uh, the soil has largely been pulled back. Um, in terms of visual uh, visual impression, uh, things look uh, pretty impressive. It's very hard to see the skid road now. It's been quite successful. And we also have some trees growing on the site. As we all know, continual communication is the key to successful equipment operations. The equipment operator, the harvesting supervisor, and forestry staff need to work together and learn from each other. Well, wow, this looks really good, actually. Sometimes, there might be some times where we want some 
some water bars left for drainage, like little gully pullbacks, but not or very like deep. What I did behind you there? Oh. In summary, successful skid road rehabilitation starts with a good understanding of the site conditions and management constraints. Proper construction is key. Removal of woody debris and outsloping decompaction will ensure drainage restoration, along with regularly spaced open water bars. Replacing soil horizons in reverse order with minimal mixing will help restore topsoil which is then protected and augmented with woody debris and slash loading similar to the surrounding area. Winter skid trails are constructed using as much snow as possible. First, snow is scraped off the cut area and compressed in the side cast area. A minimal cut is then made the same way as summer constructed trails, with the topsoil safely stored under the running surface. Snow is typically mixed with the subsoil to create a running surface that sets up very hard overnight. Winter constructed skid trails must be rehabilitated the same winter as they are impassable after snowmelt, and drainage control is needed before snowmelt occurs. Winter rehab is similar to summer except that decompaction is less of a concern if a good snow running surface has been used. Woody debris is first removed and the snow running surface ripped up and snowy chunks discarded. The original soil surface is checked for compaction, decompacted if necessary, and then the subsoil and surface soil are replaced. The woody debris is then placed back on top to achieve a slash loading similar to the rest of the cut block. Remember that the trail will settle as the snow melts out, so recontour thicker than summer trails to compensate for this. Trail like this is a winter trail here we have, and uh, there's a fair bit of snow on it, so the compaction in this trail isn't too, uh, isn't too uh, much at all. Yeah, mainly I'll just break up the snow in this, in this application here and I'll go to the original ground and take a look at it. And I'll, I'll even break original ground every so far to uh, just see how much compaction I have in the original ground. But with this much snow on top, it should be none. What I'm looking for is uh, the height of the snow that we have on our trail. This is, a, again, a winter trail that's fairly flat. So you'll have a fair bit of compaction all the way across on your trail here. So what you want to do is you want to start on the inside of your trail break your ground and work to the outside and see how much uh, snow you have on your trail. And if there's a fair bit of snow, then your compaction under the snow shouldn't be much at all. And if not, then you break your ground uh, and break your compaction out and work to the outside. And after that's done, uh, I'll grab that woody debris that's around the edge of the trails that builds up along the edge of the trails and that, and I'll throw over top of the trail and scatter it around as you can see in here. And in, in these stumps that we have, that are left uh, sometimes when building trails and that. What I try to do with them is I'll grab them from the side or wherever they are and I'll, I'll try and plant them in to the reclaiming uh, portion of the trail to try and get the natural look back. Okay, so we're on the trail that Les was rehabbing and you can see uh, the broken up running surface here. This is all uh, snow and ice. A little bit of soil and lots of woody debris on top. And uh, if this trail had a lot of woody debris on it, uh, he would make sure that that was broken up, that it's not still cribbed in the trail and could divert water. Okay, when I'm constructing the trail, what I'd like to do is get rid of my snow layer first. I side cast this snow layer out to the outside of the trail. And once I get that in position, then I'll go after my mineral soil here, the starker soil that you can see here and I'll put that on top of the, the snow on the outside of the trail. Once that's done, then I like to, to work with my subsoils and put that on the outside of the trail. And then uh, at the end of it, if I still got a little bit of snow, I'll put it on top of the trail, use it for uh, firming up the trail when it tightens up in the cold weather. Your cut would be yeah, roughly half your uh, trail. 
if it's sandy and that. I, I like to mix my dirt with the, my subsoils with the snow. Uh, it'll make a firmer trail for you too. Yeah. Yeah. Especially on your outside, like on the outside of your trail. You want to make sure that in the wintertime that outside is uh, fairly firm for your machines. Just before I last rehab this trail and talks about what he's going to do, I just want to emphasize one of the most important things to do when rehabbing any kind of trail is to take care of the woody debris that's cribbed into the running surface. Uh, when we get all these branches cribbed in, uh, they become oriented with the trail and they, they'll act like a, a wooden culvert, a pipe to pipe water down the hill if we don't take them off. So the most important thing first is to take these off, throw them on the uphill side, you can grab them later, and make sure that you don't have cribbed in woody debris left in that inner track when you're rehabbing. Okay, first the uh, first thing I do in uh, rehabbing the trail is, like Mike said, I, I uh, want to remove this woody debris off the trail first. Um, then I uh, go to the inside of my track here and I break my compaction out of my trail on the inside track working to the outside. And then once I have the compaction broke out of the trail and that, I'll uh, start reclaiming the subsoils in against your uh, cut here. To its natural height if you can get it as close as possible to the natural height. And then I'll try and grab the, the mineral soil, the darker soil on the outside of the trail and uh, put it over top. And then with this woody debris at the end, what I like to do is I like to uh, scatter it around on top of my trail. And winter, you like to. In winter, what I like to do is I like to leave my uh, trail reclaimed just a little bit higher than the natural uh, surface because of the shrinkage of the of the snow inside the dirt. And I'd probably throw a water bar in about every uh, I don't know 50 meters to 70 meters somewhere in there. Depend on your your ground, your layer of ground, and that. I leave them exposed. The only thing I might put in, put in them is a little bit of debris just uh, for camouflage or whatever, but other than that, no, I leave them open. So we've got the, uh, he put the subsoil near the bottom down here. Then he scattered, uh, you know, the mineral soil, the, the top soil, as, over as best as he could. And he did a great job of uh, breaking up the slash that he had pulled off the running surface. He pulled the slash off the running surface, stored it down there. He brought it up and shook it around. And that looks uh, really good. So what we have here is an excellent example of a deep water bar, which is what we want to see on all Skid Road Rehab. This water bar cuts through the inner track and is out sloping outwards uh, right through the uh, skid road and uh, it's uh, left open so when we come back 
if we're doing any monitoring in the winter, when we come back in the summer, we can tell that drainage control has been installed. This, this area was harvested in the winter, and they weren't able to uh, rehabilitate all the trails in the winter uh, because of frost, you would say. Right, so then what we do is we go in and uh, put in water bars uh, to control the water for the spring runoff until we can get back in and uh, we have the, the trails in the spring that we thought of. So this was, this was summer construction, this trail? Yeah, this was constructed for uh, last fall, I think. Yeah. And so on, on a trail that's uh, more of a summer constructed, you can uh, do that. And you said there was three feet of frost in the trail? Uh, you in some places, yeah. yeah. But you're still able to water bar through that? Well, uh, it takes a while, but you can get through it. <laughs> okay. Did you have special teeth on your bucket? Yeah, you got to make sure you've got good teeth on your hands on and uh, rip through it so you get the water bar through. Okay, excellent. It's important to have that drainage control uh, right. for spring thaw. Of course, if it was a winter skid road that was half built out of snow, you'd have to rehab it. Right. Then. Do you find them easier because the frost isn't set up as yeah, well? Yeah, the frost doesn't penetrate as much as the snow. He was able to cut down uh, very deeply and get an excellent water bar even though the trail was frozen. Uh, this is very important. If you've had a trail that's been con constructed under summer conditions, it's very important to uh, if you don't have to rehab it right away, it's very important to get these water bars in after you finish your winter harvesting. Of course, it would be much more desirable to have a winter constructed trail, but sometimes there are reasons for summer construction. Uh, perha perhaps they got rained out in the fall. They didn't have enough wood ahead in, in terms of flexibility to come back next spring. Monitoring of skid trail rehabilitation involves checking for deep water bars, buried woody debris, sections of running surface that are not decompacted, and reasonable restoration of the topsoil and slash cover. So uh, what we want to see is we want to see that as much of the forest floor as possible has been replaced on the top. Uh, there's been uh, woody debris scattered on, on top. Uh, similar slash loading as the rest of the cut block so that the skid road doesn't stand out and uh, provides some shade for vegetation to get established and helps protect the soil from uh, some erosive forces. In addition, we want to have a good planting medium. You can see that this soil is nice and loosened up and there's not much woody debris buried inside, okay? You don't want to have much coarse woody debris like this or this at all inside the soil. Uh, the odd piece is okay. You start getting a lot, it can start to move water around. Not only if, can they start to pipe water if they're oriented in the same way, but they also represent an undesirable rooting substrate imagine this mixture here. Um, this is what I would call a sucking air deposit. There's not uh, good water holding capacity. There's a lot of air space with all the branches in there. So we, we want to make sure we try to get those out. They belong on top. And we have a nicely loosened rooting medium with not much subsoil. Okay, most of the subsoil is in depth. And there's some forest floor and fine branch material mixed in. This is going to be a very good rooting medium. The other thing that we look for as we're going along the rehab trail, we want to see are there what appear to be any pieces of running surface still intact. Okay? And where you look for that is often in the mid-road location. Okay? If you think of your normal uh, cut and fill construction, it's a mid-road location where there isn't much cut or fill. So if they're putting the fill back in the cut, the mid-road might still be sticking out a bit. And if you see that, you want to start digging in it and making sure, say, this looks suspicious here. Is it decompact? And you can see here, 
This trail is, is wonderful in Ekapaki. Rehabilitation of haul roads follows the same principles as skid roads and has been successfully carried out by some West Kootenai licensees since the mid-1980s, such as Atco Lumber Limited. Here's an example of one of Crestbrook's haul roads. You can see the excavators in the distance doing the rehab. You can see Bruce Nickel from Crestbrook grass seeding it already. The best thing you can do is grass seed immediately after disturbing the soil. And there he is uh, seeding away. Off in the distance, we see another older cut block that they had done skid road rehab on the bottom. Random skidding on snowpack on the top. And over on the other side here, you can just see the edge of another block that's got skid road rehab. So once again, we are reclaiming the maximum amount of the forest land base for future production of trees. And they will be growing trees on this haul road again. So we brought it. DA cat in here and strip the top layer of soil off that will be conducive to growing back trees and, and grasses and put that aside in the windrow on the outer edge of the road and then had the, the DA cat build his road surface from the material he removed from the ditch and build the surface of the road. And on completion of logging, we will decompact this road, rip it all up with a hole and then remove the windrow of topsoil and woody matter and bring it back across on the site to put it back into productivity. Landings can also be rehabilitated using similar techniques, but those with large cut banks typically involve so much unfavorable subsoil that it's usually only practical to rehabilitate the outer half or two-thirds of the landing. In this particular area we had a, a hole come in and he pre pushed all the right away we pushed the landings, piled the right away wood in different piles, and then we brought the DA cat in, stumped the area, pushed the topsoil in one particular area so we can recover it. All the slash and woody material that was still left on the area after this push fell was deposited in another pile so they're totally separated, so there's no mixing action in there, so we can still recover our topsoil when we're finished logging after we decompact it be able to take the soil and spread it back across the landing and get it back into some growth. So yeah, that's a good point, Don. The most important thing is that we want to put our topsoil in a separate pile and keep the woody debris away from it. We don't want to, there's a natural tendency if you're on sloping ground to side cast it and then build the debris pile on it. Well then when you burn the debris pile, uh, because the fire's there a long time, the soil actually gets quite hot and you can burn some of the organic matter out of the soil and permanently alter it with the heat. So, so this way we're, we're salvaging the soil, we're keeping it separate, and then we keep the landing debris pile over here separate. In order to evaluate how trees have been growing on Skid Road Rehab, we've sampled sites in the East and West Kootenays representing a range of soil and climate conditions from as long ago as 1984. These sites are growing trees, and with improved techniques applied to the least sensitive sites, we don't see any problems restoring soil productivity. More sensitive sites still need further study at this time. Here we are up the Lucia River, uh, looking at an example of Skid Road Rehab that was done some time ago. These are zoological pine seedlings that we sample as one of our retrospective studies. We see uh, trees in the uh, inner track position, the, the mid road position, and what we call the berm side cast position, where uh, the soil has largely been pulled back. Uh, in terms of visual, uh, Visual impression, uh, things look uh, pretty impressive. It's very hard to see the skid road now. It's been quite successful. And we also have some trees growing on the site. However, there are some differences. On the undisturbed, there's a lot of vegetation competition, and the undisturbed trees aren't growing quite as well as the uh, berm side cast trees. But they're growing better than the inner track and, and mid-road trees, 
which I feel, even though they, they had during their establishment, and even now, hardly any vegetation competition, they are growing on a very calcareous subsoil, an unfavorable subsoil. And I think that's been affecting their growth. We're going to be doing some foliage sampling to look at the nutrition of these trees. Whereas the burnside cast trees, uh, even though the material on the surface is still calcareous, they have access to the undisturbed acidic forest floor and depth. So this is an interesting area. Uh, we don't think, you can see here, it's a little bit flat. The inner track was probably not ripped here, and this could be confounding part of the problem with these uh, mid-road trees. And so you get a feel, if you don't decompact here, you can have some definite problems, not only in terms of slope hydrology and slope stability, but also in terms of tree growth and the growth of other vegetation. Here we are at Grave Creek in the Rocky Mountains again. We're in phyllite derived soils. These soils are quite clay. They're not as calcareous. Here, uh, Dave Basaraba from Crestbrook uh, kindly uh, put in a, an installation, a trial to see how well the trees are growing on the skid road. Uh, can you see the skid road here? I guess the blue, blue stakes help you find the skid road here. Uh, we have uh, trees planted from the inner track, uh, mid road, outer track, and the uh, side cast. And then there's lower undisturbed and upper undisturbed. Generally speaking, uh, my recollection of the data to date is that the, uh, the side cast trees are generally doing the best. This area was slash burned. Uh, vegetation competition is less of a concern. Uh, at the beginning in terms of establishment, but you can see now in the undisturbed we're starting to get a lot of vegetation coming in. This is in the ESSF as well. So again, uh, this looks uh, very successful in terms of visual quality, uh, probably reasonably successful in terms of slope hydrology. Again, no ripping of the running surface as far as I know. That should have been done but they were just starting out, and, and this is a real good uh, first start. And in terms of tree growth, it, it looks to me like we're gonna get some trees growing here for uh, another crop. They basically reconquered uh, the skin roads here, and we have some uh, natural regeneration of, of logical pine growing on this. This was in 1984. And the, uh, the top of the cut bank is up back up in here. These would be what we would call inner track trees in terms of normal skid road uh, disturbance types. I would be standing in the mid-road location and down here would be the berm side cast which have been, has been largely pulled back up onto the running surface. So uh, you can see that we have effectively restored the rooting volume uh, on uh, up the hill here and we've uncovered the, uh, or made uh, less disturbance in terms of pulling back most of the deposit uh, where the side cast was. So this is the inner track here. And we're currently studying how well the trees are growing on this disturbance type. Uh, there are some assumptions that these trees will grow as good as undisturbed trees. So we're doing a study at this time. We have a technician working with us to look at uh, whether that is in fact the case. We're going to try to get more uh, research sites established for that. So if anybody knows of any old rehab, let us know and we can uh, try to see if we can study how the trees are growing on them. So that's the undisturbed tree. The next tree we dug up was down here, which is what we would call a berm side cast area. This tree here you can see is smaller. However, it was still uh, developing a reasonable tap root and it had similar roots going off on the side and you can see this this tree was a bit smaller if I were to stand the same location for scale again so that's the uh, berm uh, side tack track tree the third tree we dug up was growing right here and this is what we feel is probably part of the uh, partly where the running surfaces. Running surface is probably just down here still. 
and that would uh, represent a compacted layer. So we looked at this tray, we figured it's about looking at the nodes, it's about the same age as the other trees, and we'll determine that later. And we can see that this uh, tree has a very distorted tap root. Going off to the side, probably because of rocks and probably because of compaction. And uh, so I think that just goes to show a little example that we want to have the maximum amount of rooting volume available for the trees. And so we've dug down here, Jeff and I, and, and lo and behold, we've encountered this dense layer down here. Uh, what? After, uh, let's see, 12 years uh, after rehabilitation, and I think it might be up to 14 years after logging, you can still see what we've got some uh, very, very strong platy structure here. This soil is very compact here still. Whoops. And uh, if you recall, you can see puddled layers, typical of a running surface some crushed and buried organic matter, and you can see uh, this, the soil is still clayed. This just goes to show, uh, you know, the fact that compaction is a fairly long-lived phenomenon. In summary, Successful skid road rehabilitation starts with a good understanding of the site conditions and management constraints. Proper construction is key. Removal of woody debris and outsloping decompaction will ensure drainage restoration, along with regularly spaced open water bars. Replacing soil horizons in reverse order with minimal mixing will help restore topsoil which is then protected and augmented with woody debris and slash loading similar to the surrounding area. In order to evaluate how trees have been growing on Skid Road Rehab, we've sampled sites in the East and West Kootenays, representing a range of soil and climate conditions from as long ago as 1984. These sites are growing trees, and with improved techniques applied to the least sensitive sites, we don't see any problems restoring soil productivity. More sensitive sites still need further study at this time.